It's okay. The light is okay. How is it now? Hey. Mr. Richard, it's okay. No, it's okay. Richard, the light is okay from the camera. Well, if you. Give him that. Size of hands. Size of hands. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, uh, I think one of them is funny. Oh, my boy. What do you like? You are a little money. 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 No, no, no. Come here. Thank you. Why no Why 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 I have fine. I'm not moving yet. Hold on, hold on. Check me. Wait, 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 wait.
Good morning, welcome to Meet the Candidates. This is a special feature on AIT Kakaki. It's an opportunity to have the various presidential candidates talk about their programs, their plans, and their policies for the Nigerian people. Anchoring this uh, segment with me this morning is Shola Daisimi. Yes, a very good morning to you, our uh, viewers of Kakaki, the Af African voice. This is part of AIT's contribution to different democracy, and of course, uh, let us know and let you know what the various candidates for the presidential election, which is scheduled for the 16th of February, what they have in store on the various platforms. And this is the very first edition. We'll be having all the presidential candidates uh, talk to Nigerians and talk to uh, those who believe in Nigeria about what Nigeria has in store as it concerns the presidential seat. So we'll advise Asorok on the, uh, following the election that will hold on the 17th, rather on the 16th of February, uh, the various presidential candidates Tell us what they have in store. We have in the studio this morning the presidential candidate of the Action Democratic Party, Yaba Jisani. We also have the presidential candidate of the Africa Action Congress, Omoyele Shoare, and also the presidential candidate of the Sustainable National Party, Mr. Ahmed Buhari. So we'll be taking them on on various questions and what you want them to do as it concerns with Nigeria. What are their plans? Uh, they've thrown their hats into the ring. <laughs> to contest for the presidency, hoping to uh, occupy the Asurov Villa. So we'll throw these questions to them. But before then, there's a little profile that we've put together, a graphic illustration of who and who these three candidates are. Like we might have just said, uh, Ahmed Buhari is a businessman, and uh, he is the presidential candidate of the Sustainable National Party, the SNP. While uh, Yusuf Yagbayi, 64 years old, he is the presidential candidate, and he's also, incidentally, he's also the national chairman of the African Action Congress, no, rather, Democratic uh, Party. Demo Action Democratic Party. Uh, so that is Yusuf Yagbayi for you. And 
uh, Shorore, a former um, student union leader in my alma mater, the University of Lagos. He's a publisher, he's also uh, the founder and owner of the Sahara Report as an online media platform. So we'll have those slides for us. We can look at uh, their profile on the slides uh, shortly. Back to the program. Uh, it's uh, the AIT mid for presidential candidates, and uh, we will launch straight into the discussion. But before then, let's just have a short profile. We, we, we showed you something earlier. Let me just uh, say something about some of the candidates, the three of them we have here this morning. Engineer Yusuf um, Yagbaji I was born on the 1st of July 1954 in, uh, in Bida, local government area of the Niger state. Uh, we have his uh, early education. 1961, East Primary School in Bida, Niger State. And after primary education, he attended secondary technical school in Kotangura from 1970 to 1974. And he began his career in Niger's oil services sector with the NNPC. He was a depot chief of the uh, depot in Kano from 1980 to 1983. And later, he threw his hat into the ring as a politician. Ahmed Bouari of the Sustainable National Party is a 38 years old Lagos based businessman. He is the CEO of Skylar Inc. He is from Kunta Gora, United States. He has degrees from the Federal University of Technology and Cavendish College, London. Okay, uh, Omoyele Showare is from Kundu State, Elijah to be precise. And uh, he was born in the Niger Delta region of the country. He is the founder of uh, Sahara Reporters. He went to the University of Lagos. In fact, he was the student union leader at the University of Lagos. And um, he earned a degree there before he went to Columbia University in the US. And then he lectures at the City University of New York and the School of Arts in New York. He's a political writer, he's a public speaker, he's also a human rights activist. So these are the three candidates we have on Meet the Candidates this morning. So, you might let's pick it up. Yes, we want to give the candidates an opportunity to make opening statements about the plans, the trust of their campaign, their policies, and what they have for Nigerians. First, we'll start with Yabai Sani of the AAP. Okay, good morning, Nigerians. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know this is a historic uh, event uh, that we arrived in the 2019 uh, election. Urgent intervention is required because we cannot go back to the status quo and then continue, meaning that we can't go back to the era of PDP and we cannot also continue with the status quo uh, that we have today, which means we cannot continue with the administration we have in place today. And I believe that I possess the requirements in terms of qualification, educational qualification. By the way, I also went to Columbia University in New York, and I also attended some uh, programs in Harvard Business School to, uh, to add to my profile, because you did mention that. And I believe that also prepared me to face this peculiar task of rescuing Nigeria politically, economically, and socially. Because in Nigeria, believe you me, we have so much deficit in even the basic five requirements of as a human being to exist on this planet. That is the biological needs, meaning that the issue of food, the issue of shelter, 
is, is a challenge to an average Nigerian. The issue of safety is a challenge you know, to an average Nigerian. The issue of love, the sense of belonging, the government, the administration we have in place does not portray a, an administration that encompasses all of us. The issue of somebody being able to aspire to become whoever they want to become in this country. You can't stand in an election and hope to win even after the votes have been cast for you. So I believe that this country, being a country with the promise of the natural endowment, which is abound everywhere you go in this country, any state you go to, you find something that can make that state independent and can, in fact, make the whole nation independent. This is a nation that has the promise of greatness. And the only thing, the challenge we have, the disability between, between us and that greatness is leadership. So what I'm saying is that a country with this young population that are educated, intelligent, that when you give us opportunity outside this country, we excel. We become either number one or a very good number two. We cannot continue like this, given the promise of this country. Why? Because we cannot go from 7.5 gross rate of GDP to 1.5 gross rate of GDP. Nigerians cannot afford to become the poverty capital of, 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 the, of the world with all the resources I've, I've mentioned, which are there abound. We have a comparative, comparative advantage in terms of the trade with other countries. If you look at our oil and gas sector, it's a sector that other countries have made very good advantage of in developing their people. What have we done? Today, I was reading that uh, National Assembly was questioning NNPC on the withdrawals from the LNG account. I'll tell you why they can never get to root of the, of the, of the source of, of that, um, that problem. The reasons are that we don't measure in this country, we don't monitor in this country, we don't control in this country. The candidate of the Action, African Action Congress of the ASC, Omoyele Shobori. You want to talk to the uh, Thank you. Good morning, Nigerians. Uh, in 1999, Nigeria came to experience democracy. And it did not happen until young people like me started in 1989 to bring about the struggle that brought about democracy in Nigeria. Mm. Students, you know, activists that fought on the side of the mm. people. It is time to put them away. Mm. It is time to give Nigeria the oxygen it needs to progress, make peace, and prosper for everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Shore. I'm Fuhari, the presidential candidate of Sustainable National Party Economic Economy. Good morning, Nigerians. Um, it's good to be here. My name is Albert Buhari, and for some funny reason, my profile was rushed like a never, nothing has ever really happened in my life. Um, yeah, I came from FETV now, very notable in my study geology. So I worked with oil and gas for a few years as a geologist, um, doing some well for this country. Um, and then I have two master's degrees, one in um, graphic information systems and fashion analysis, and the other in um, international trade and marketing. I um, have worked with the telecoms as a business development manager. I have worked with the chemical engineering companies in Lagos and East Africa. And I've also, in my little space, created a company for myself where I try to engage many young people in and around Lagos. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, we go into the race because um, we go tired of um, sitting down in the corners and fight ourselves. For most, um, for most young men just my age, what we do mostly is to criticize each other or we take sides regarding depending on the political party that we find some affiliations with. So for me I just decided that we need to create a new narrative, we need to change the discussion. And the only way we can do this is the first people recognize that hate is not the first enemy of love, it is fear, because fear destroys our ability to trust. Most Nigerians mm -hmm. have unfortunately um, have failed to realize that um, the only way we can have a progressive country is when we embrace ourselves regardless of all of those things that have always divided us, whether ethnicity, religion, political party, political affiliations, gender, and even age brackets. And, you know, contrary to what most people think about the failure that has happened in this country, I think um, the elders have given their best, but we are determined to come here and say we'll give our all. Um, I understand governance, has, governance comes with its own challenges, but what is most important for us to understand is if we do not have a collective people, if we do not have a united people, we cannot have a progressive country. And so those are the things that we stand for. And if we do the entry, we want to have this in go to the next level, but we must have to create that avenue where we leverage our comparative economic advantages, have a secure country, decentralize this country, and most importantly, see how we can run this country using property and management systems. Okay. <coughs> Okay, we, we, we've had the opening statements of the three uh, presidential candidates. 
um, Omoile Shore mm -hmm. of the Action African Congress, that's the AAC, Yusuf Yagbari of the Action Democratic Party, and of course, um, Ahmed Buhari of the Sustainable National Party. Uh, we, in the next couple of minutes, we will be going up for our other segment, that is Kakaki Social, but let's launch into the discussion before we do that. Uh, let me ask uh, Omoile Omo Shore. Now, um, you said it, Nigeria was named, almost everybody is aware of as the uh, poverty capital of the world. Ahead of what does this mean to you, and how do you mm -hmm. tend to address the crisis of poverty and hunger as it concerns Nigeria? I would to address the issue of poverty and hunger in this country, we must uh, invest in our people. We have always said it, that Nigeria's greater resource is not oil, it's not coal, it's not gold, it's not cocoa, it's Nigerian people. And for us to have that future that we deserve, that we desire, we must invest in them. In fact, the World Bank came out about uh, two months ago and regretted that they forced the Nigerian government over mm -hmm. the years to invest not in education, not in health, but in other areas that have not added value to our lives. And this is something that we fought for in the 90s. We fought against the, you know, the Structural Adjustment Program. We fought to have this country invest in education. In fact, as student leaders, we had what we call ACARES, Academic Reform, which was the first, best ever program that would have brought about education across the board that would be free, affordable, and available to all Nigerians. So for us to do this, we must do a few things very quickly. One is that we must provide for this country and our people power, electricity, energy. Uh, we must make Nigeria secure for Nigerians who are living within Nigeria, for Nigerians who want to uh, come back home, or for anyone, for that matter, who want to work within the Nigerian space. And we must invest in food security, agriculture, not the subsistence agriculture that we are practicing today, not agriculture of propaganda of, you know, we are talking about rice mills closing down in Malaysia and Singapore, whereas you don't have anyone popping up in Nigeria, but you say that you are producing rice when there are no rice mills in so for us to be able to secure a future for the people of this country, we must start sending our children to school. 13 million of them are out of school who can even make it to primary school. We are not talking about secondary school. We are not talking about the fact that there are not, not enough spaces in our university to absorb a team of young people who want to go to school. And finally, it's also important that we understand that when you train, you send people to school, you provide them jobs. And that is what our party plans to do. But mm -hmm. first and foremost, providing 5 million yes. jobs mm -hmm. through three critical intervention areas. We're talking about power through renewable energy, where we want to move the power sector production from 3,000, miserable 3,000 megawatts of electricity today to 24,000 immediately. We're talking about paying living wages to workers. 100,000 Naira is our minimum wage which most people might have condemned, but the people who are condemning it are the same people who are receiving 14 million naira per month. I mean, uh, per month. You know what it takes? It takes about 35 years for a Nigerian worker any 30,000 naira per month to earn the salary of the Nigerian senator. But the senators are the ones who are complaining. The governors are the ones who are complaining, not the people who are at the bottom, scraping the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you say you have a question for them? Okay, so, um, um, uh, Shore, you mm -hmm. need to hold your thoughts there. We will now go for our Kakaki Social. When Nigerians talk to Nigerians on social media, and uh, AIT brings their views to you. So we might we'll take that up. And we'll come back on Meet the Candidate. Which cam am I using? Cam, cam what? Three. Three. All right. Is this blocking? No, no. OK. Breakfast healthy today. Abuja, Friday, 20th of November, 2018. The Dar Sasa Fortnite 2.0. Dar Sasa Fortnite 2.0. Dar Sasa Fortnite 2.0. Dar Sasa Fortnite 2.0. Comedy by Pony Boy, MC Koboko, Chris No China, MC Bar, Nick B, Jokester General, MC Tawai, and more. Music by Faze, Star Wars. On the wheels is DJ Xmart. Appearance by Big Brother Niger, Tim Tonton, Tibe Moren, and Vinta Booker of AIT. Value, Congress Hall, Trench Cup, Abuja. Red Cup starts at 6 p.m. with Toby and a Don't worry. 
Date, Friday, November 23rd, 2018. Tickets, regular 5,000 naira. VIP, 10,000 naira. Table for tag, 200,000 naira. Tickets are available at Dar Communication Complex at Soko. Japanese restaurants will say two. For reservation, call 0803-322-4022 or 0803-329-4854. This event is powered by... Okay, okay. it's time for us to find out what Nigerians are saying on social media. Thank you, Shola. Good morning, welcome to Kakaki Social. On this segment of the show, we spotlight the issues that shape conversation in the Nigerian social media. I am Ohimai Amaize. So what's trending this morning? <laughs> AIT is trending. Kakaki Social is trending. Your presenter is trending on social media. <laughs> okay, yesterday, the special assistant to the president on new media, Tolu Ogun Lesi, came at AIT and myself on social media yesterday attacking us, he actually called me a PDP agent. And that issue sparked off a lot of reactions yesterday from Nigerians. Let's go to the social media and take a look at what exactly happened and what transpired. Tolu Ogun Lesi attacking AIT, attacking your presenter yesterday. He has called me a PDP agent. This is what he tweeted. He said, this is the AIT TV show that fabricated the story of a visit by VP and Amechi to OBJ. Show host is a PDP agent with a reputation for fabrications like this. Doing dirty work for PDP. Plan was to make it seem like VP went to beg OBJ. Hmm. His tweet got some reactions. Let's take a look at how Nigerians were reacting to this tweet yesterday from uh, Shoshelaya Idaraya tweeting at Shoshelaya. Tolu, I watch this show every morning and all they do is read out trending tweets and laugh. They didn't fabricate this story. And they also pointed out that the account quoted was OBJ's parody account. You are changing a lot. It's scary. Don't lose yourself. Uh, we'll take a look at more comments from Wonderfully Cree One. Uh, I watched the program live this morning, and the presenter said clearly that it's a parody tweet. So look upon less you should watch the replay on YouTube. A Nigerians reacting to this issue yesterday <laughs> from Ima Ikume. They reported it on AIT because it was trending online. If you follow the program, you will understand that Kakaki Social is about things trending on social media. That's why they reported what La Lua Conde tweeted so as to state the true fact of what happened. And um, from Chosen Somto, Tolu Ogunles' problem is the presenter. It is not a secret that he envies Oimai. He got a response to this tweet from Henry Banks. Envy Oimai? For what exactly, please? Tolu can never envy that guy. Oimai is not professional at all. From Eric Banks tweeting yesterday, I told you guys I was trending yesterday, you didn't believe me, now you can see. Olaumi95 tweeting said, uh, and you are a professional, right? Mr. Fix Nigeria is the only presenter out there actually showing to the leaders, Nigerians and the world, how the people and common Nigerians feel about the ruling class and lets us know what is trending. Of course, the recorder yesterday, we brought you this issue of the... Uh, the reported visit of the Vice President Yemi Oshibajan to Ota, along with the DG of the President Buhari, uh, Skampe Rutini Amechi. This issue was trending in the Nigerian social media. It was not fabricated by AIT. It was not fabricated by Kakaki Social. There was a report on Daily Post which stated exactly what we reported yesterday. This is the story on the website of Daily Post, published November 21st, 2018, as you can see. Oshibajo Amechi meet Obasanjo. Let's take a look at the next slide which captures details of that report. As you can see, images have been made of the meeting, Vice President, Prof. Yemi Oshibajo and Director General of the President Muhammadu Bari campaign organization, wrote to me a held with former President Rusheko Basenjo. Still in that report from the website of the League Post, the meeting between the duo and ex-President Basenjo was held in Ota, Ogun State, behind closed doors. This was Daily Post reported. A Nigerian online newspaper with a verified Twitter account reported that story. So this was, not very, this was not fabricated at all by AIT or Kataki Social. Now, let's go on and take a look at uh, this issue which we need to really clarify right now. We don't fabricate stories on Kakaki Social. We don't generate comments on Kakaki Social. The idea of this show is basically to show Nigerians what people are saying on the social media, comments about various issues that are trending, and on this show, President Buhari, issues about President Buhari have been portrayed on this show. On Kakaki Social, issues about the PDP presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, have also been presented on this show. 
So we don't actually know where this is coming from. We are not partisan at all. This is a show that the idea of Takaki Social is just to show Nigerians what people are saying on the social media. So we don't publicate comments. And uh, we go on and take a look at uh, this issue that also trended yesterday. A person to ask AIT to retract false report of meeting with Oshibajo in Ota. Of course, we treated this issue yesterday as a trending issue on the social media, but that was a report uh, uh, on Premium Times. Uh, Mr. Obasanjo, in a statement by his media aide, Ken De Akinyemi on Friday, said the portrayal by AIT was false and also demanded a, an apology for Mr. Oshibanjo for the embarrassment it might have cost him. He expressed disappointment in the station's failure to verify the fake Twitter account before airing it on the station, stating that he was in Sokoto for the Zero Hunger project at the time the false news was aired by the station. What's in that statement, uh, the media aide of uh, former president of Asanjo? It is a fact that severally, the former president has dissociated himself from owning any social media accounts. Therefore, it is highly disappointing that such sensitive Twitter posts would be allowed to go on air without verification by the African Independent Television AIT, Mr. Akinye misstated. But the truth is, did Mr. Akinye may actually watch Kakapi Social yesterday? We stated clearly that the tweet we read of the former president, Lucia Gombasinjo, was a parody tweet. This is a footage of what happened yesterday on Kakapi Social. Let's take a look. Details of this report. Uh, images have emerged of a meeting Vice President Prof. Yemi Oshibajo mm -hmm. and the Director mm -hmm. General of the President, Muhammad Gwari Campaign Organization, Rotimi Amechi held with former President Olusegun Obasanjo. The meeting between the duo and ex-president Obasanjo was held in Ota, Bogun State, behind closed doors. Daily Post reports that the meeting held hours before the book launch of former president Goodluck Jonathan in Abuja. Media people were not allowed to cover the said meeting. This is Daily Post filing this report claiming that uh, the former president met with Yemi Oshibanjo and Rotimi Amechi in Ota before he attended former president Goodluck Jonathan's book launch on Tuesday. Well, let's take a look at how these uh, generated some talk. These are the photos from that meeting. You can see the DG of the Muhammad Ubari campaign, Rotimi Amechi, shaking hands with her passengers there. Uh, this is the image of saw before and comments already, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo tweeted at Chief underscore Obasanjo. Well, it's not Chief Obasanjo. This is a parody account of the former president tweeting said, yesterday, the Vice President of Nigeria, Yemi Oshibajo and Amechi, paid me a visit to seek for my support ahead of 2019 general elections. Despite the innuendo that I'm no longer in pressure as regards Nigerian politics, I don't know why they're still rushing me. <laughs> That's, these are not the words of Chief Obasanjo. That's a parody account. Just so we're clear. And then from... Okay, so what's really the furore about... Uh, mm -hmm. We stated clearly yesterday that it was a parody account of the former president. And I think media aides to people in high places need to apprise themselves with how the social media space works. On Twitter, parody accounts exist. Her Majesty the Queen of England has a parody account in her name. This is the parody account of the Queen of England at Queen underscore UK. It has 1.5 million followers. Twitter allows users to create parody accounts, and as long as they clearly state that those accounts are parody. And uh, we stated clearly on the show yesterday that it was a parody account, and on the bio of that account, it was also stated clearly that it's a parody of the former president. And if you look also, uh, President of the United States, Donald Trump, celebrities, organizations across the world have parody accounts named after them. So this is, this is, this is Donald Trump's a parody account. It has 87,000 followers. Twitter would not shut this down because it is clearly classified as a parody account. It's part of the Twitter rules and regulations. So media aides, before they issue statements on behalf of their principals, need to know these things. So this is the parody account of uh, former President Lucia Gorbassenjo. It's clearly stated, not Chief Dr. Lucia Gorbassenjo, parody. And we did not make that mistake of attributing it as the words of Chief Lucia Gorbassenjo, the former president. We stated clearly yesterday on the show that this was a parody tweet. And like I said earlier on Kakaki Social, the idea is basically in a light-hearted manner sometimes to present to Nigerians issues that are trending, what people are talking about, their politicians, uh, things people say about Atiku have been said here, not so complimentary things. Things people say about uh, Gwari have been said on this show, not so complimentary things. It's the way social media is. You win sometimes, you lose sometimes. And uh, let's go on and take a look at uh, uh, yesterday, what we, 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 how we treated this issue, just to follow up with Tresla. We treated this issue as 
something that was not verified. Laulua Conde debunked the report. And we also used Laulua Conde's tweet debunking that report. Take a look at this clip. Laulua Conde, media aide to the vice president, tweeted yesterday. He said, Ignore reports VP Oshibando alongside Minister Amechi held meeting with former president Obasanjo in Ota. Yesterday at the Unamdi Azikiwe International Airport Abuja on his way to Lagos, VP ran into the former president who had just landed. The exchange pleasantries. Period. So that was what happened. According to Lalo Akonde, it was just a chance meeting at the Unamdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja. They didn't go to Ota as being claimed on social media to see the former president. And okay, so I don't know what exactly is the issue. Uh, in Nigeria, reacting to this issue yesterday, this morning actually tweeted that for the Esquire, if you know this segment and the manner of reportage of the anchor, you will know that he makes efforts to verify the handles he puts up and even calls out the parody handles. I, for one, thought OBJ really made the tweet until I saw Kakaki Social yesterday and found it to be fake. So media aides to former president of Asindu, you should actually be commending AIT for calling out that account as a parody account. Not issuing a statement on behalf of your principal asking AIT to retract the story. It wasn't a news report. It wasn't on the news bulletin of AIT. It was on Kakaki Social, the social media segment of Kakaki, which is a segment that brings issues trending in social media. And we treated it as a parody for the records. So, well, just in case former president, Lucia Passenger, is still angry, we are very sorry. We retract. We won't do it again. Edge also, Emma Binu. <laughs> okay, on that note, we wrap up Kakaki Social this morning. Follow the conversation mm -hmm. on our social media platforms at Kakaki Social on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at Kakaki Social. I am Ogimaya Maize. Kakaki Social returns on Monday next week at 8 a.m. Stay tuned. Meet the candidate is still on. I'm joining Shola right now as the conversation continues. Okay, how you mind? Uh, nice one there. Those uh, review files and uh, reviews out of our work went on Kakaki Social. Now, just keep talking to yourselves on social media. It helps to deepen the democracy space. Now, we're back with our uh, AIT meets the candidates. We have three of them in the studios here already with us. We have uh, Yusuf Yagwadi. He is the uh, presidential candidate of the Action Democratic Party, uh, or Omoy uh, Yenle, is of the Action African Congress, is still here in the studio. African Action Congress. African <laughs> Action <laughs> Congress. <laughs> okay. And Ahmed Buhari is also here, he's of the so Sustainable National Party, the SNP. It sounds like a Scottish National Party. Anyway, he's schooled in the UK, and I'll take my next question to him. So, um, ah Ahmed, uh, you have a name that is uh, similar to that of incumbent in Asura. How, how has this, uh, how have you handled this? Well, um, I remember when we started, a lot of people said, um, we, we started with one nickname on social media, which is Ahmed B, and a lot of people said, look, you better, you better use your real name because it's gonna come hunting later. People might find out um, your real name is uh, Ahmed Buhari and uh, start saying why did you go with a different name. But overall, um, I l we like this kind of um, discussions because Nigerians have got to separate themselves from how they would normally stereotype people based on names, based on ethnicity, based on uh, even the, the faith that they practice, and understand that every individual stands in his own realm, and you should treat them um, as individuals, not as what you perceive to be a collective. Um, so it's it's there. Um, people turn heads sometimes. People who are in support of the current administration would say, we don't like you, even though you're saying something that we like. <laughs> Some others would say, um, it doesn't matter, we'll just uh, move along with you. So whatever the case is, I think Nigerians should focus on the issues, Nigerians should focus on the personalities, Nigerians should focus on the antecedent, you should actually probe a little bit further, not just on the surface dressing. And so that's how we've managed, um, that's how we've managed the name um, in the last uh, two and a half years when we declared to run for the office of the president, which was the first of 2016. And um, in that we'll still be able to sustain this with us with all the um, support group that we've had. Okay, so Ahmed, you, you, you run a business, you work in the corporate world, right? Uh, you're 38. That's actually, wrong. again, that's a wrong assertion. I'm actually 40. 40, okay. Yes. Okay, good. So, um, how, how, how do you think we can get out of that tag which we have now as a nation about being the quality capital of the world? How do we drive people away? First, first of all, I, I've seen those reports from the World Health Organization, from UNICEF, from other organizations that are international. 
I think it's a, it's a disgrace upon Africans, in particular Nigerians, because these reports always come from outside the country, outside the continent. We are in the quagmire that we find ourselves because we've not been able to clearly identify how many people truly exist on, on this continent, especially in Nigeria. So everything you see are figures that have been manipulated, they are projections, they are speculations. Still, as we run this country, as, as we run the nation, we still haven't had people who would tell us categorically, I have been counted, I know I have been counted, the government counts for me because I, I share my data with the government. And that is why we can't seem to work with the country. I give an example, you run a house, you run a home, you have a wife, you have children, you know exactly how many bags of rice you have to buy in that house, tomato, whatever you, you have to do to make sure the house is running properly, how many children you have to pay school fees for. But now you're in a country where you can't tell exactly how many people exist. And then we always depend on this data coming from the international community. How many children out of school? 30 million? How do you know? I think there are less. How many Nigerians exist? 160? 200? I think we are less. You can argue with that because many people haven't been counted. Many people haven't been accounted for. So to answer your question with regards to what I think we can do to actually move the economy forward, I think government has got to separate itself from doing business. Government's responsibility is to ensure that it put in, in place rules, guidelines, and checks and balances to ensure that the private sector is doing exactly what it should do according to the laws of the land. But when we seem to have a a government that in every single segment has got it, it, it becomes a competitor with the private sector. We can't move forward. The only way you can drive the economy, the only way you can increase jobs, the only way you can reduce unemployment is to ensure that you allow the private sector to thrive. And the only way the private sector can thrive is to ensure that there is power, is to ensure that you have um, uh, you, you, you don't have stringent policies that undermine the progress of this private sector, is to make sure that you create an enabling environment where foreign investors can come in and say, okay, fine, we can do business in this country. And most importantly, we must understand that before Nigeria can function properly, we have to decentralize. And decentralization goes beyond people talking about pulling sec uh, sections of this country apart from each other, but we're talking about ensuring that the different institutions that we have in this country are being pushed to the state government. The people need to know who to hold accountable should anything be falling short. Okay. That is why we're not able to run this country as efficiently as we should. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Aguari. Now to Yawaji Sani, what, what is going to be your plan to move Nigeria away from this current situation where we find ourselves as the poverty capital of the world? Um, thank you very much. I, I think Nigeria, like I said, is a promise uh, of greatness you know, on the continent of Africa. And how do we get there? How we become the, the promise of uh, leadership in the world, not only in Africa itself, is because we are blessed you know, we have those things that other countries who have less, maybe less than one percent, one uh, ten percent of what we have, and today they are being described as developed, you know, uh, uh, countries. What I will do, our government will address the issue, like I said, of how do we run the government itself? How do we key? How, how do we allow the 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 the, the, uh, the, the population, that's Nigerians, you know, how do we carry them along? What I'm saying is that you see. If you have an economy that is properly sector driven, mm -hmm. there is no way, except especially in a country that you have people who do not even uh, 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 respect our laws. People do, are, not, are, not, are not even, they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't even proud of this country. And unfortunately for you, you have, you have the, at the end of affairs, when you take this jumbo law that you turn us to be slaves in a few years' time, they share the, 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 the money among themselves. So if we, our government will come and drive this economy to become a private sector driven economy. Because we have all the ingredients. We have everything that you require. Take for instance, I, I, I kept talking about the oil and gas sector because even a private company would look at his cash cow and see how do I manage that cash cow so that I can use whatever I'm getting from that cash cow to develop the other, other, other segments of my business. The same thing in a country. You don't joke with your comparative advantage in terms of international trade. You develop that sector, you man that sector properly, you ensure that whatever revenue you get from that country is properly plowed back into the other sector of the economy. That's why you talk about diversification. Diversification, you need, you need money. Diversification does not mean you should go and take jumbo loans. You can use your own internal generated revenue. If you now properly arrange you know, the operation of your sector that, is, that has an advantage with other countries, for instance, in the, in the oil and gas sector, why are we not refining our, our, our crude oil and gas 
in this country? Why are we exporting jobs to other countries that have already, you know, are developed? You know, you ask you ask yourself that question. Other countries are, are thinking of the like Ghana. Ghana is thinking of refining everything they, they produce in terms of crude oil within, and they export refined products. In Nigeria today, we we we, we have people that have taken us to the to the to the fools. You know, they they they, they, they even the one allocated for the, to refine domestically is being sold by the same people who will now go and buy the refined products uh, on commissions that they pocket. You know, and then bring and then take it to us, and they will tell you that they are paying subsidies. Okay. What I'm saying is that. Nigeria, this country, the drafters of, a, of, of our constitution are aware of all these things. That is why they have some, uh, some act of parliament that are supposed to be enforced today. You ask yourself, a country is only as strong as, strong as its regulatory agencies. Our regulatory agencies in this country today are the weakest that you can ever find anywhere in the world. You, you, Look worked, at the, you worked in the energy system, so sorry yes. to interrupt you there. Yes. Um, and you know, as a Nigerian, do you think NNPC should be, should be wholly privatized? You see, when you talk about privatization, you know, uh, I'm not, I, I will say yes and no. Yes, if you are bringing foreign investments, if you are not giving it to yourselves, who have no knowledge, who do not even like this country, to, to, if you are selling NNPC to yourselves, I will say no. And I would rather say, why don't we go for commercialization? Why don't we open up this NMPC, invite direct foreign investments, so that, and the management also, not only direct foreign investment, so that they can come with their money and management and run this, this, uh, this enterprise for us. Okay. It's not a Nigerian, oil and gas sector, it's not a Nigerian uh, 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 enterprise. Thanks. It's supposed to be run as you have what you call international best practice. If you don't do that, you cannot account for, today, we don't even know how much we are producing in this country. We don't know how much revenue is coming into this country. CBN does not have a tracking system to tell us how much of export of crude oil that has been sold, 90 days are supposed to be, to be okay, in our account. Uh, CBN does not have it. I'm challenging them. Let them tell that's us. That's so a hard place to so the point I'm making is that yeah. we have to grow you know, our jobs in this country. And the only way we can do it is when you grow your GDP. How we can grow our GDP is to make activities in this country to be high. Your currency is only as strong as your productivity. Okay. Productivity means you have more jobs. So if we make this economy to private sector driven, believe you me, a hundred thousand naira you are talking about as minimum, minimum, a minimum wage will be will be uh, uh, something that you, you don't even think about. Okay, thank you very much. Well. We're going to security now, and then I am coming to Omoyele Shawore, the presidential candidate of the AAC. There's been a rising wave of insecurity in the country. Boko Haram that uh, has been supposedly technically defeated is still carrying out very devastating attacks in several parts of the country, especially up northeast. And also, we've seen the Hesme killings in several parts of Nigeria, especially in the Middle Belt uh, regions of Nigeria. What is your plan to arrest the security crisis in Nigeria? Let me tell you this as a, a reporter that's covered uh, the security issues in Nigeria for the last 12 years. I can tell you that everything revolves around leadership, you know, and uh, we cannot move Nigeria forward without addressing leadership. And now it comes to the military. And quite honestly, with due respect to this gentleman to my right and left, the, the issues at stake are so high. I wish that AIT was honest enough to bring the likes of uh, Buhari, I mean, not this Ahmed, but Muhammad Buhari, uh, to my left, and Atiku to my right. And I heard this, uh, the candidate at AIT, I know you are denying, but uh, you guys are very PDP ish. Everybody knows that. That's uh, correct. So it's true. Uh, but right. let me say that the stakes are so high, we should be debating with people that are not shielding them. These are the people that we need to really discuss the issue of Nigeria. But they are the ones who have failed us. And talking about insecurity now, I want to make it very clear. You know, you don't have people fighting Boko Haram in Nigeria. You have people who are doing business with Boko Haram. And I have said this because I reported it before. Under President Goodlord Jonathan, we were reporting in Sahara, we were saying that Army generals, both in the Navy, Air Force, and the Army, were stealing from the people. They were just using Boko Haram as a cover to enrich themselves. People said, no, you are, you are wrong, you know, they are fighting. Eventually, when Buhari came in, they found money everywhere, inside cooking pot, in tanks, you know, in sewage. From Army generals, when they did the uh, investigation up to the Army, when the rich people were working in the government, they shut down the investigation when the rich 
the former uh, army, uh, chief of army staff, Damba, who is now minister of uh, interior, and when he reached the current chief of army staff, they shut down the investigation. We are deceiving ourselves in this country. The same thing with kidnappings, the same thing with armed robbery, the same thing with uh, the headsmen. Anytime you see a security issue becoming national embarrassment in Nigeria, somebody is benefiting directly from it. So how did you? And, and I made, you know, I made. A, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to direct. I made a proclamation. Now, one of the things we need to do that a serious president will fire all these army generals. I'm serious, and that's one of the things I'll do as soon as I become the president of Nigeria next year, and bring in, you know, cadre officers who can manage the war. I met with an army captain who said they can eviscerate Boko Haram in one month because the forest there has been surrounded for years. So each time they want to move towards Boko Haram, somebody says in Abuja, don't go. BBC even reported it, that there was a time they had Shekau within range to kill him, and somebody called and said, hey, we're calling you up. And now, the Nigerian army that ended the war in Liberia, ended the war in Syria alone, mm -hmm. has become a ragtag army that Boko Haram can kill 70 soldiers from. And we are here discussing, you know, security issues. We don't have a security issue. We have a leadership problem. And that is why we must change. I can stay here and be reading figures to you, how much we need to spend. But until you change the players, you can't win the game. And that's why we are presenting ourselves. This country has reached a point where we must make revolutionary decisions. We must change the leadership of this country. We must get rid of our political leaders and political soldiers, political custom officers, political naval officers, political air force officers okay. who are not working in the interest of the Nigerian people. Okay, let, let me go to Ahmed now. Uh, Ahmed, what do you think? We see here, um, Shoghi has spoken extensively about what he says he will do to you know, the, the armed uh, forces leadership. We, we know what, that. What, what you, what's your take? We know what would you do about the forms of police, the, uh, the civil authorities? We know, we, know, we know very well that there's a racketeering going on in all of this, and that is why it's an unending war. But you see, I keep thinking about two things. Should I just keep spraying the mosquitoes to kill it, or should I clean my environment to ensure that you know, the mosquitoes don't come back? These things are very important for us to understand and how to separate. So, We've been working very closely with people on the ground when it comes to security matters in the northeast, especially. And I, you know, one other thing that's happening to us as a people is when this whole thing started from the northeast a few years ago, most of us said it was a northeastern problem. Let it remain there. But like everything that starts sometimes is the only way it's going to end. Um, the fundamental problem with the northeast is that the people have lost touch with Nigeria itself. The people do not believe that they belong to this country. And so when you see people voluntarily joining the Boko Haram, it's simply because they find so there's more in the Boko Haram than with the Nigerian people. You don't have any infrastructure for the people. You don't have schools, you don't have hospitals, you don't have food, nothing is there for the people. And then here comes Boko Haram, who is probably cashing in on both sides from whoever is sponsoring them or whatever the Nigerian army or the Nigerian government is doing to actually support them. Now, what I think we should be thinking of doing is to see how we can wage this war from a different perspective. It doesn't have to naturally be a crush war. It can actually become an ideological war where we get the minds of these people understanding that we still like them. Nigeria cares for them. And this doesn't stop with just Boko Haram. It goes across the entire country. Every single segment you turn, every single corner you turn to, you find people who are totally discontented with the country. You find people who do not want to remain in this country. More than half of the people in my generation are actually sitting down today working on how to leave this country. And that is because they do not believe in anything in this country. And the moment they are able to leave this country, they become a menace. Because when they cannot leave and they cannot leave in the country, they start killing the country. People will definitely revolt. And the, 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 case, the chaos is not just for the Northeast. You find it in every part of the country. You find clusters of area boys, clusters of different things that we cannot, society cannot really absorb. And so this, this vacuum is widening and a lot of things are going inside the vacuum and that is because like he said the leadership problem is there uh, okay, not giving uh, the uh, people uh, that hope of yes. belonging mr Barrett, put it in proper perspective yes. if you become president yes. on uh, you are you are sworn into office on may 29 next year right what would be your first action on the issue of security so we have to dialogue we have to talk we have to talk to the people because clearly i have seen a lot of people in the north before going to the northeast who would tell you look i'd rather be with the book of around we saw how the Boko Haram returned from the grounds and they were celebrating. The people have accepted them as their new officers. They control the region. 
And that is because they are more available to the people than the Nigerian government itself. The Nigerian government doesn't exist in those areas. We need to talk to these people. We need to calm down. We need to understand that when we're giving strategies on how to get Boko Haram, disarm them or something, it's not about going to... I've seen security experts who have actually talked to the Nigerian government and say, you know what, we want you to go into this place to actually have conversations with these people. But what do we see? We see bombs being thrown. So, like he said, I think it's all been arranged. Whenever you see it's about to die, something needs to go up again, and then money keeps so going. So we need to we need to dialogue, and then we we'll move on to uh, Yabaji Sami now. The crisis of security in Nigeria, Boko Haram, headsmen killings. What will you do as president of Nigeria? Well, in addition to the fact that we need to grow the country so that everybody will find something to do, I mean, you you ask yourself, uh, Nigerians are, are, are going uh, killing themselves in the Sahara you know, and deserts, and then on the Mediterranean Sea. Know, dying. If Nigerians can go to that, to that then uh, it's, it's really simple. You know, uh, if you have somebody who will just <laughs> employ them and then provide, you know, at least their basic needs for them, they will be ready to do anything because they are dying. They know, they know that going outside to seek for for greener pasture will uh, will end up most likely that, that their life will not be uh, will be saved. So, so what I'm saying, what we are going to do is first of all grow this economy. That's that's critical. Professionalize the army. You know, the all all the armed forces. Engage in dialogue with these uh, the insurgent groups, and then try to see how you integrate them to reintegrate them into the society, and then you can eliminate, you know, what you call uh, Boko Haram or whatever other form of insurgency that you're talking about. So, our administration or our government, you know, will start, will will take as number one priority how do we grow this economy because it's so it's so easily can be easily done. You know, this country is the promise of you know greatness. So and, and it's what that because the, the, the bottom line of all these problems are talking about about Boko Haram, whatever other other vices you want to come up, it boils down to are you able to provide jobs for those people that are able and capable? You have spent money or their parents have spent money mm -hmm. training them and they come out, they can't find anything to do. For God's sake. So the point I'm making is that we will we will we'll solve the problem of, uh, of, uh, of uh, insecurity by providing jobs. Please, nothing else can be done unless you make people to be a stakeholder in their country. Today, no, no, don't no, no, that suggest you don't agree with your uh, suggestion that you would fire the service chiefs on day one? Professionalizing. Maybe professionalization will mean, you know, uh, 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 you may not fire. You can say you deploy. You will deploy people to other, other areas, you know, so that, for instance, how do you keep the service chiefs that have served the staff? What are you saying? You are introducing disloyalty in that system. We know that the uh, people serving in the armed forces cherish and they, they, they are always looking forward to that you know, uh, that opportunity to be to be uh, at the hands of affairs. Okay. Now you have a government that somebody has served this time. It's not that they are doing anything fantastic because if they are doing something fantastic, we wouldn't have Boko Haram killing people just two days ago, you know, then, and you are keeping those people. But what's reason okay, thank, for thank, thank, thank you very much, sir. Before we continue with the next issue, which is anti-corruption, uh, to our viewers are watching, you can actually participate in the conversation on our social media platforms at AIT Kakaki on Twitter. Uh, the hashtag to use is Meet the Candidates. It's also been scrolled on the screen. Uh, just so you can participate, you can send your thoughts, your questions, and your comments to us uh, as the candidates are still with us this morning on this maiden edition of Meet the Candidates. Okay, let's go to um, Shore now. Let's talk about uh, the anti corruption. What's your perception of the state of uh, this menace in Nigeria as we speak. Now, what would you do to ensure that corruption is removed? Uh, you know, I, I come from a background that uh, has worked a lot uh, fighting corruption as an individual, and I've done it with several other persons uh, as uh, a reporter, as an activist, and uh, an anti corruption fighter. What I would say is that uh, what we need to start doing is to prevent goods from getting their yaps. That's the starting point to fight corruption. Even in advanced countries, in places like the US, the UK, the moment people steal, it costs a lot of money to retrieve or recover the money from them. But in Nigeria, because of the way we do business, the way we conduct our businesses, the way our big men have access to our treasuries, we do not have a way of ensuring that they don't steal before we start running around. And right now, the anti-corruption fight in Nigeria has become a fast because a lot of the people who are corrupt have become so powerful and are in charge of various agencies of government. 
they are in, in charge of various institutions of government, including our judiciary, where sometimes you can even find that judges are serving at the pleasure of corrupt persons. And you take the same corrupt person before these judges, you expect them to send them to, uh, to prison. They don't go to prison. Or when they go to prison, sometimes, you know, I've heard that uh, there are people who are sent to prison and they got a vacation from prison. You know, they get their passports returned to them and they travel outside of the country. What I'm saying here is that, you know, we have to make sure that we use technology to prevent corruption from happening. There's several other things we are doing in this country today that people should not be doing. Uh, I use the example of post workers, for example. Like with the little technology you have out there, even with a small company, you can use fingerprints and enter into the office or your retina, uh, uh, your, you know, I mean, technologies that are activated using your eyes before you can enter into the office. But in Nigeria, you can't even find a federal office in Nigeria that has an iron or wooden gates that are functioning properly. There's, we are still using part work. So many of the offices don't have windows, they have no toilets. So we are talking about ghost workers, you know, maybe when you have one million Nigerian workers, 20% or 27% of them are ghost workers. These are things you can get rid of, you get rid of with technology. Even our uh, uh, purchasing uh, processes, I use an example of universities who go out and give contracts to people to buy them laptops. When you can actually, universities are the places where we buy the best laptops from, where I teach. Uh, the School of Visual Arts in New York. Anytime I need a laptop, I go to the university store. That's where you can buy. But in Nigeria, universities still give out contracts to contractors to buy them, you know, things that they could purchase uh, over the internet or online. So it's a function of how you use technology to get rid of corruption. It's a function of how you then ensure that people who are referred to as goats or we know as goats don't have access to your yard. And most importantly, then you go to deterring people who are thieves. Okay. We cannot continue, for example, giving awards, national awards, to people who are known to be corrupt, or you give them uh, positions, or you call them elder statesmen. You know, they become mentors to children who are looking forward to a brighter future. You allow thieves to be people they look up to, and you want to fight corruption. You're wasting your time. Again, this is why leadership comes in. This is why we have to ensure that we retire these people. And I want to say one thing finally before you go, regarding security, that we need to fire the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. And that's what we're about to do next year. Thank you, you know very much, uh, Shawari. And uh, Ahmed Wari, what's your take on anti-corruption? What would you do differently from this current administration? You, you see, in most cases, it's about clearing the environment so that it doesn't um, allow whatever it is, the rodents, to, to thrive. Now, there are two things that make this corruption thrive. The first part is, how do we appoint people, or how do people emerge when the wrong people leave the office? The reason why Nigerians do not really fight corruption collectively is because we do not really take part in the process that gets us the elected officials in the first place. I keep letting Nigerians understand that each time a politician comes to you and gives you money, because it's running an election campaign. Be sure to understand that when he gets into office, he's going to recoup all of that money at an interest rate that only he can determine, and at a return of investment time that only he can determine. So when he gets into office, his first assignment is to see how he can recoup all of the money he got, whether from Godfathers, whether from his own pockets. But the reason why he gives us money is because the electorate that he's trying to rule with nice ideas are still saying, find us something. So you cannot see the people able to go and fight and say, you are actually stealing our collective resources because they are actually eating part of it. Now that's the first problem. The second problem has to do with proper data management systems. And when we talk about proper data management systems, they help us fight everything across the board. From the people that we block this country through the porous borders, who will come into this country and we don't ask them why they're here, how long they intend to be here, when they intend to, be, to leave, how they infiltrate our system, how we cannot even understand who is in Nigeria and who is in Nigeria anymore, when the infrastructure that you try to provide for Nigerians because you think there is certain number cannot suffice because the, the actual population of the people in the country is beyond your expectation. Now, with the civil service, we've seen where a lot of people, a lot of African countries have actually adopted that standard where there is no permanent staff in the civil service. Your promotion, your demotion, 
your exposure from the civil service is dependent on your performance. There are KPIs that are put in place to ensure that these individuals live up to expectations and failure to do so, they are being pulled out of the system. So what we're looking at is if we do not have those proper data management systems that will ensure accountability, transparency and efficiency, you're going to have a private civil service, you're going to have a private people, you're going to have politicians who will say, okay, this is the budget and this is exactly how we spent it. At this time, we should be able to sit down here and say exactly what the budget was for, how it was spent, and Nigerians will understand and relate with it. But Nigerians do not want to relate with it because we are also part of the problem. And this is very important because the electorate, on the other hand, are waiting for you to appoint somebody from your own jurisdiction, your own locality. I, I hear people say they did not appoint anybody from my local government. How does that affect your life? If somebody from your local government has been appointed, are you trying to say to me that you, if you make him become more efficient? I think it's because Nigerians would want to go and meet that particular person and say, give us something. But what we should be focusing on is not whether the leadership is picking people from a particular part of the country. Our focus should be, are these people competent? And when they're incompetent, that is when we should raise our voice to say, you are failing, falling short in your in your journey. Okay, let me go to uh, the presidential candidate of the Action Democratic Party, uh, Yusuf Gambari. The clamor is on now, restructuring, restructuring, restructuring. What is your well, you know, my take is that restructuring in the 21st you know, century economy is supposed to be an ongoing thing. It's not something you stop and say, let's gather people to have conferences and then after that you don't do anything that would be important in the conference. You have a law, you have a constitution, which is a living document. This constitution can be amended at any point in time when you elect the right people to represent you at the, people, at, at the right places. What am I saying? We have what we call concurrent list. We have what we call explicit list, you know, of everything that happens in this country in our constitution. It's a matter of taking from one list to the other, and then, and then going forward, you will now have whatever changes that you require, you know, in, 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 also in your quality, in your economy, in the way we, we interact with each other. Everything is in that, in that document called the constitution. And because mm -hmm. constitution itself mm -hmm. cannot work unless you have people that will come out and then administer it, that is why you elect it on its letters to go and then work for it. What am I going to do? I will make sure that we have rule of law enforced. I will make sure that the act of parliament that are not enforced in this country today, like, take for instance, you have what you call already known as a fiscal allocation commission. That commission in a serious country is supposed to be empowered with some kind of, you know, business aggressiveness so that they can monitor whatever is flowing into the federation account they can now determine what goes to the, to the various tiers of the government. You also have, you know, a, a act of parliament that, in a, a, for instance, if you go to Ministry of Trade Investment, there is a department that takes care of how you, you measure your trade, you know, what you give to other countries, what comes to you. You know, so the point I am making is that the structuring is something that's supposed to be an inbuilt, you know, mechanism in a country like this. So why we are not having it right is because of leadership. You know, should have, should have made sure that you Nigerians know how much is accruing to us. The Nigerians know how much is going to you know it's it's a, it's a sector of the, of the economy because okay. the whole thing is blank. You know, we don't we don't know we don't right. know how much we are making from crude oil uh, from from oil in, in, for instance or any other thing for that matter. So you have agencies like Naiti. Naiti is supposed to work for you to ensure that what you are getting. The, the processes of getting those revenue from the oil and gas sector is in, is in line with the kind of best practice. They also go further to find out how do you apply those revenues. Okay. So if we are not employed, if we are not implementing the, 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 the laws that we have in the land, you cannot have restructuring. Restructuring, right. restructuring if you are looking at political restructuring, that's a different thing. Right. But if you address the issue of the economy, everybody has a sense of belonging. Then the, this, this uh, noise about restructuring that you are hearing will die down because it's because the institution you have today have not taken any uh, made any effort to bring people you know together that okay you belong also that and you know the information on what is happening so all right th th we, we will address it in that way thank you very much uh, let's move on to education now uh, mr moyele shuare uh the nigerian education system is usually described as in a state of comatose uh in a state of coma so what would you do specifically about the nigerian education system restore it to that part of glory that it used to be several years or decades ago? Well, I don't know if uh, we want to go back to what we used to do decades ago. <laughs> we need to uh, understand that the education system of countries around the world has <coughs> moved and is driven by technology now. Uh, what I'll do is investment. We have to invest in education in 
such a way that we never done it before. And we have to start breaking down that investment in a way that is specific. For example, if you're talking about 13 million kids out of school, I want to spend 100,000 Naira each on every child that is out of school per year. Uh, and then make sure that that money takes them back to school. It pays for their books, it pays for learning materials, it pays for their teachers, it pays for lunch programs for them. Uh, I'm talking about institutionalized ways of investing in education, not you know uh, dashing out money on the streets to people um, and saying that we are getting them uh, to go back to school. We want to do the same thing for uh, secondary schools. We want to infuse technology into the way people learn. I find this shameful. You know, and I mean this, that my daughter in the U.S. has more books in her room than my high school in Ondo State today. Uh, and that my son can use uh, a laptop, you know, or uh, a tablet, uh, as we call it. And there are university students here who don't even have access to them. Uh, or that the university can actually teach people where I teach. I can reach my class if I can make it to school by staying remotely somewhere and teach my class. And here, several universities don't even have functioning websites. The students don't have emails. So would you increase yes. funding to the We sector? will increase funding, but beyond that, you know, we have to make education affordable. Yeah. Uh, people talk about public sector-driven uh, economies. It doesn't work like that. If you don't invest in your people, you won't have a public sector I'm sorry, private sector. I mean, I want to say private sector. Mm -hmm. You can't have a private sector that is not operated by sharks. And that's what we have in Nigeria. So you want to give as much, or in fact, the best. If I didn't have free education in 1980 to go to secondary school in Ondo State, I'll probably be a palm wine tapper today. And I guarantee you, so you palm wine tapper will be the best at tapping palm wine, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, that investment that came from our world was free education made a lot of impact in my life. It made a lot of impact in a lot of people's life. But today, it's the same people that shut it down, that are in charge of the, you know, uh, the country. As they say in Lagos, the man who shut down the metro line came you know, 20 or 40 years later to, his, you know, uh, to commission a bus station. <laughs> so, that's 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 yeah. so, so it's, it's investment it's and ensuring worry. that we make education free. I wanted to say finally, please, that you know, during my own time, we're going to make Money is available to university students. For every person that stays in university, a hundred thousand study allowance will be made available to you. Okay. If you graduate and you don't work in the public sector, you pay us back. If you do work in the public sector for four years, you, that money doesn't get uh, you don't get asked. Okay, okay. okay. hold it there, uh, Mr. Buhari. If you are elected president uh, next year, will you travel abroad for medical treatment? <laughs> I'm not traveling abroad now for medical treatment. I'm fine to stay here. Um, I think. Um, it's beyond just the infrastructure that we have for the health sector. It has also a lot to do with the kind of services that we have in those buildings that we think we have created. So for me, with regards to the health sector, I think I think the fundamental missing element is facility management. So we have some buildings that exist and we think they truly are medical centers, but when you go in there, they have nothing to offer. So our plea is for us to have a country that is moving forward with regards to healthcare and things like that, we must have proper facility management systems, we must have the right kinds of staffing to actually operate those places. And, you know, when we talk about data and how to process data, a lot of people seem not to understand what we're talking about. You cannot successfully have this kind of infrastructure reaching the people if you do not know how many people exist. So as I speak with you right now, the government is probably planning to site another hospital in Asoko, when in reality, the people in the rural areas are the ones that need this things. When you have proper data systems, you know exactly where you need people, where, where, where this infrastructure needs to meet with those people. And that is why we're, we're looking at places like Femo, where you find a lot of DDF and issues like that. And you think that the problem is just because they're marrying young, at young age, but not really. It's because before they can get access to healthcare, it is too late. Okay, so, um, um Mr. Buhari, you will not travel abroad online again if you become president. I just answered you that. Okay. So let's uh, go to uh, uh, Mr. Yusuf Nagbari for your closing statements. A minute. Well, I, I'd like to thank you very much for doing this, but like uh, one of my colleagues here said, we need to really bring people that are uh, in power now, or people that uh, have had power before and have put us where we are today. 
so that we can really engage them properly and tell them that they have filed their time and they should please allow this space to be operated. They are watching Monday. you, are listening. Yeah, they are listening, but I'm telling you that the fact of the matter is that we have a golden opportunity to make it right, get it right in this country. And getting it right means that stop doing the same thing the same way so that you can now begin to have the results that we deserve. So this country, like I say, is a promise for greatness. This country represents the future, you know, the, the great future. Because I believe if you look back, countries that started with us in 1960 or so, like Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, you can see where they are today. Indonesia, for instance, has over 1.1 trillion, you know, GDP today. And look at Nigeria with the population we have, with the promise we have, one point, we have just 300 something, and up, uh, 365 billion dollars, you know, GDP. For God's sake, what are we talking about? We have more population, we have more resources. Nigerians, please wake up. You know, you are not supposed to be poor, you are not supposed to be killing yourselves, you are not supposed to be hating yourself, you are supposed to love yourself. And this country is a promise for that. Thank you very so much. So that's what Mr. our my administration will do. Thank you very much, Mr. Yabadi. Just to make a very quick clarification, Mix the Candidates is a platform to help candidates meet the Nigerian people and share with them their programs and their policies. So it's an opportunity for you as a presidential candidate to talk about your programs, your plans, and your policies to the Nigerian people. Uh, Mr. Shore, very quickly, in one minute, your closing Thank statements. You. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, I just want to call on Nigerians that uh, here comes another opportunity for, uh, for us to make historical decisions, Irish and revolutionary decisions, and that it is not enough to vote next year. We have to vote for credible leaders, and this might sound uh, a little bit uh, stale because we hear this all the time, but it is particularly important that we do not uh, choose between the two major candidates of the two major political parties now. Uh, both of them handicapped, handicapped by incompetence, handicapped by corruption. You cannot vote into power a person who has been cited and indicted somewhere for collecting bribes of 40 million uh, dollars and can't even travel far and wide and expect that this country will experience prosperity and progress in future. Okay, Mr. You also cannot, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, calm down, my no, moment is not over. Uh, and you cannot it's also vote for someone who is incompetent, who is known uh, not to have um, produced anything or made, um, made this country move in any direction and expect a different result. Vote for results oriented, fresh, Progressive, your candidates like myself, and the best option you have is to work becoming okay. president of the federal Okay, Mr. Uh, Ahmed Buhari, closing statement quickly. Thank you very much. I, I think um, Nigerians must understand that the problem is the same across the board. There is no second of this country that is um, you know, alien to the problems going on or affecting us as a people. And so for us, I think most important, Nigerians must come collectively to ask for accountability. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been watching Meet the Candidates, the maiden edition of Meet the Candidates, the platform on AIT Kakaki to help uh, the presidential candidates talk to the Nigerian people about the, their programs, their plans, and their policies. And we've had in the studio this morning the presidential candidates of the Action Democratic Party, Yagbadi Sani. We've also had the presidential candidate of the Africa Action Congress, Omoye Ali Shore. Shore. There's a talk on social media that you're one of those who is trying to help uh, President Barry divide the votes. And then we also had this morning uh, the presidential candidate of the sustainable uh, national party, Mr. Ahmed Buhari. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. And it's now time for us to hand you to our colleagues, Salamatu Ibrahim and Chiko Dinakaize, for the wrap of Friday's edition of Kakaki. But don't forget that this discussion will continue. AIT meets the candidates. And that's for Friday? Exactly. Thank you so much, Ibimai. And Shola has expressed it and said, Well, we tell our viewers to keep their comments coming as you can see below as your screen. The views are being shown. Thank you so much for being a part of the program. We'll see you again next week, Friday, for another edition of Meet the Candidates. In the meantime, have a wonderful weekend. I am Salama Uzi Brandon. I am Chico.